I was planning to go to Leibniz next, but yesterday I'd been working with John Dewey, and my brain's in the right gear for Dewey, so I'm going to do a short video introducing democracy and education by John Dewey. After that, I might do some videos on certain key passages in this text for the Philosophers in Their Own Words playlist, following which I may combine them for a longer video for the Great Text playlist. Now, what is this book? Democracy and Education, originally from 1916 by John Dewey, the American pragmatist philosopher. In this book, Dewey explains how education continues the life of a democratic society. Now, Dewey's philosophy regularly considers society after the model of a biological organism. That's his preferred method, his strategy, his uh, preferred way for thinking through social and political philosophy is to compare it to um, biological life. And after all, society is made up of humans, and humans have biological life. Now, it's the nature of life, Dewey says, to renew itself, as with biological life, so also with the life of a society which renews itself by education. Education initiates us into and trains us to participate in the experience of being human. So the right understanding of humanity must be expressed in education. Now, what is the right expression? Uh, what is the right understanding of humanity to express in education? Well, for a start, Dewey rejects any dualisms of mind from the rest of the human being. This is something he explores in great detail, looking at oh, historical sources like Plato and various uh, cultural, philosophical, theological perspectives that separate the human being into uh, the mental and the physical, or some such uh, dualism. And Dewey rejects any dualism of mind from the rest of the human, and his views on education concur with that assessment. Education must not be purely intellectual and neglect to involve the whole person. And also, Dewey rejects any unequal social structure, for unequal social structures would mirror the same dualism of mind from the rest of the human. The individual human is not separated into unequal parts, and society should not be separated into unequal parts. And where does that leave us? The best form of social organization is democratic. Now, best does not mean perfect in any sense that would imply that it doesn't need to change. A society like an organism grows and develops, and a healthy, growing, developing, democratic society will renew itself by an education that involves the whole person. It will be an active education, not one where students passively absorb information, but one where young human beings learn to use and to channel their energy into creative and useful action. This will, of course, involve a good bit of scientific education. It will also involve some old ideas and some old books as introduction to and training in the moral and intellectual life of the society's past. This is actually the more conservative aspect of Dewey's philosophy of education. Having said that, I should perhaps immediately correct myself and say it's a little better to say that Dewey rejects the idea of any dichotomy of conservative versus progressive, as is clarified further in his book Experience in Education, which I don't happen to have on my shelf. It's a short f book. Uh, you could think of it as a sequel to Democracy in Education. Um, this is a long one, <laughs> relatively speaking. Uh, Dewey's Experience in Education is um, much shorter. Now, this is a beautiful book, and... And I hope to explain more of its meaning in subsequent videos. See you then. From John Dewey's Democracy and Education, Chapter 1, Education as a Necessity of Life, we read in the first sentence of the book, The most notable distinction between living and inanimate things is that the former maintain themselves by renewal. Dewey goes on to elaborate for a few paragraphs on how life renews itself. It's the nature of a living thing to renew itself. Here he's been speaking of biological organisms. But now we read, we have been speaking of life in its lowest terms as a physical thing, but we use the word life to denote the whole range of experience, individual and racial, and it turns out life is not just for a single organism, but life is also for a community, for a society, indeed for the human race. Life covers customs, institutions, beliefs, victories and defeats, recreations and occupations. Human culture, human civilization is life. The continuity of any experience through renewing of the social group is a literal fact. Education, in its broadest sense, is the means of this social continuity of life. It is the nature of life to renew itself and supplies to the life of society. And a society's means by which it renews itself is education. Education is what trains the next generation to 
keep the life of the society going. Beings who are born not only unaware of, but quite indifferent to, the aims and habits of the social group have to be rendered cognizant of them and actively interested. Education and education alone spans the gap. Society exists through a process of transmission quite as much as biological life. This transmission occurs by means of communication of habits of doing, thinking, and feeling from the older to the younger. Everything human beings do by which we convey the, the habits, the customs, and the life of our society to the next generation is what education is. So it's certainly not, strictly speaking, a formal thing that happens in schools. But this renewal, this renewal of life, is not automatic. Yet this renewal is not automatic. It is a work of necessity, he says, and then he tells us this renewal is not automatic. So we have to take special efforts to make it happen sometimes. And there is a place for formal education. A formal education is necessary to convey all the knowledge and experience of a very complex society. We have to set aside special times, places, special... Uh, strategies. We have to make particular efforts to educate the next generation so that the life of a society can continue when the life of that society is particularly complex. Without such formal education, it is not possible to transmit all the resources and achievements of a complex society. And you are supposed to transmit all the resources, all the achievements, and in fact, there is um, a whole lot to transmit. We could go over these other lists. The uh, list here. Uh, habits of doing, thinking, and feeling. That has to be transmitted. The resources and achievements of a society have to be transmitted. The customs, institutions, beliefs, victories, and defeats, recreations, and occupations of a society have to be transmitted. For the society to keep going, everything must be transmitted to the next generation. And when the society is complex enough, we've got to have a formal education system of some sort to get that done. Now, this is all preview to what else he's going to do in this book. He's uh, speaking in general terms of education in general. It will take a while for him to get down to education in a democratic society, but he will get there. And here in Chapter 1, part of the groundwork involves laying down this, you could almost say a foundational principle, but everything in Dewey is so interconnected that the word foundational doesn't seem quite right. Central. It's a central principle. He says, there is the standing danger that the material of formal instruction will be merely the subject matter of the schools, isolated from the subject matter of life experience. This central principle, or foundational principle, but I think I like the term central better, this central principle is that education must not be separated from life. Life and experience and education are all supposed to be the same thing. The material of formal instruction must not be merely the subject matter of schools, isolated from the subject matter of life experience. All the experience of a society's life is the sort of thing we ought to convey in education. We are not supposed to reduce it to a bunch of um, intellectual subject matter. You know, don't write it all down in books and have uh, children memorize the books or memorize the facts in the books. No, we're supposed to be initiating them into the life which is to say the same thing as into the experience of the community that is educating them. That is the point of education, to renew the life of the society so that it may continue for future generations. Now, the, uh, the chapters of Democracy and Education always end with a handy summary. Uh, these are great. Uh, maybe you can't even read it if the video is not clear enough, but there's a summary at the end of the chapter, a one-paragraph summary. I think occasionally it will be two paragraphs, but there's always this delightful, succinct summary at the end of a chapter where Dewey restates everything more succinctly. Let's look at the summary. It is the very nature of life to strive to continue in being. Since this continuance can be secured only by constant renewals, life is a self-renewing process. What nutrition and reproduction are to physiological life education is to social life. This education consists primarily in transmission through communication. Communication is a process of sharing experience till it becomes a common possession. It modifies the disposition of both the parties who partake in it. As societies become more complex in structure 
and resources, the need of formal or intentional teaching and learning increases. As formal teaching and training grow in extent, there is the danger of creating an undesirable split between the experience gained in more direct associations and what is acquired in school. This, name, this danger was never greater than the, at the present time. Education is the means of the renewal of social life. The life of a society, like the life of an organism, must be renewed. Education is how we keep the life of the society going. And education means conveying the entire life, the entire experience of the society to the next generation. And we must not, although we must have a technical, um, formal, a formal education to convey the life of a complex society to the next, gen next generation, we still must not allow it to become a mere conveying of uh, information of a bunch of facts, of a bunch of knowledge that is separate from actual life. You're not supposed to be sitting in a room reading a book. You're supposed, at least not that not by itself, you're supposed to be integrating the knowledge you're getting from your education with the experience of life in your society, or more precisely, the education is supposed to be integrating these things for you and training you in integration of this sort, integration of the knowledge that you're being given in education with the experience of the life of your society, which is the whole point of that education in that society. That's what you're supposed to be getting if you're a student in education. And Dewey's going to write this book uh, to explain this in more detail and to explain how a democratic society specifically should go about this process. John Dewey's Democracy and Education in Chapter 7, The Democratic Conception in Education. We have hitherto been concerned with education as it may exist in any social group. We have now to make explicit the differences in the spirit, material, and method of education as it operates in different types of community life. So for the first six chapters, Dewey has explained his views on how education perpetuates the life of a society and explain this in very general terms without looking at any of the differences between different kinds of society and how that affects education. Later in the same chapter, all this reinforces the statement which opens this chapter, the conception of education as a social process and function has no definite meaning until we define the kind of society we have in mind. It's not very useful to know that a society perpetuates itself by education until we know what sort of society it is we're trying to perpetuate. So now he's turning to that topic to figure that out. It is therefore necessary, he says, back to page one of this chapter, it is therefore necessary to come to closer quarters with the nature of present social life. Now along the way there's much he wants to talk about. For example, this topic. There's a choice we could make between dreaming of a perfect world, some sort of utopia, and just accepting things the way they are. And Dewey says, that's the wrong choice. You need to find a way in between them. What you need to do is not settle for society as it is, but also don't just dream of a perfect world abstracted away from the society we do know. Find somewhere in between. Find some concept of the ideal that is actually informed by practical facts about the real world. And don't don't just accept the practical facts and leave them as they are. We do need, there is a need for a measure for the worth of any given mode of social life. We need to have a standard by which to evaluate different forms of society. We have to avoid two extremes. We cannot set up out of our heads something we regard as an ideal society. We must base our conceptions, our conception upon societies which actually exist in order to have any assurance that our idea is a practicable one. But, as we've just seen, the ideal cannot simply repeat the traits which are actually found. The problem is to extract the desirable traits of forms of community life which actually exist and employ them to criticize undesirable features and suggest improvement. This is a classical Deweyan way of thinking through idealistic morality. There is such a thing as an ideal, but it's informed by experience. The ideal is what we know about from what is good in experience, and we use it to correct what we know about that is not so good in experience. And this is how we should think about society and about social improvement. So what sort of lessons do we learn from experience about what is presently desirable in society 
and uh, what to extend, what to correct. Well, Dewey's idea of the ideal is an idea of equality. A democratic society is one in which all its members participate in the society's good on equal terms. And education in such a society will give young people a personal interest in social relationships and social control, uh, that is to say, just managing things in society. And the habits of mind which bring about useful change in society will be also included. Education in a democratic society means education in an equal society, and it means all people will have a personal interest in the life of the society and uh, will be trained in the habits of thinking and of doing that will bring about useful change in the future. Let's go to this passage. The devotion of democracy to education is a familiar fact. We know that democracies tend to emphasize education. The superficial explanation is that a government resting upon popular suffrage cannot be successful unless those who elect and who obey their governors are educated. The usual explanation for why a democracy has, why it needs education, is that if the people are in charge, they ought to know something. But, says Dewey, there is a deeper explanation. A democracy is more than a form of government. It is primarily a mode of associated living, of conjoint communicated experience. Democracy, in Dewey's mind, is more than just uh, something you do every now and then when you go to vote. And it's more than just a system of government. Democracy is a way of life. It is a way of life and a means of, not so much a means, it is the expression of a way of being human, a way of living in society in which there is conjoint communicated experience, in which all are participating equally in the society. Here is a fairly straightforward remark on why democracy requires equal access to education. Obviously, a society to which stratification into separate classes would be fatal must see to it that intellectual opportunities are accessible to all on equable and easy terms. In other words, a democracy is a society in which the separation of the people into different separate separated classes would mean the death of the democracy. It wouldn't be a democratic society anymore if that happened. And in order to make sure that doesn't happen, Education must be available to all on equal terms and easy terms. Let's see if we can wrap it up looking at the summary he places at the end of his chapter. Since education is a social process, and there are many kinds of societies, a criterion for educational criticism and construction implies a particular social ideal. Since education is how society renews itself, so that it may continue. And since there are different kinds of different kinds of society, if you're going to have a standard by which to critique and hopefully improve education in a particular society, you must have a standard for what is the right kind of society. The two points selected by which to measure the worth of a form of social life are the extent in which the interests of a group are shared by all its members, and the fullness and freedom with which it interacts with other groups. The interests of the group should be shared by all of its members. That's what a democratic way of life really means. An undesirable society, in other words, is one which internally and externally sets up barriers to free intercourse and communication of experience. A society which makes provision for participation in its good of all its members on equal terms and which secures flexible readjustment of its institutions through interaction of the different forms of associated life is insofar democratic. A beautiful sentence, a society that provides for all of its members to participate equally in the good of the society is a democratic society. While it also has to secure flexible readjustment of its institutions through interaction of the different forms of associated life. Uh, how shall we rephrase that? It must not only have all people in the society sharing in the good of the society, sharing in the goods provided by the society, uh, by uh, on equal terms, but also the things in the society, the institutions in the society, the structures in the society have to be adjusted. They have to be readjusted as often as necessary 
through interaction of the different forms of associated life. People have to have a stake in and an ability to influence the institutions of society when they have to be changed. When something in society has to be changed to, to make society better, people have to be involved in that. I think that's more or less what he's getting at. Such a society must have a type of education which gives individuals a personal interest in social relationships and control and the habits of mind which secure social changes without introducing disorder. We do need to have change in society. We have to be able to improve society without introducing disorder. Don't um, fix things by breaking everything. Such a society must have a type of education which gives individuals a personal interest in social relationships and control. Every individual in a society must have a personal interest, a personal stake in, a personal ability to contribute to the management of the society. That's what a democracy means. And that is what Dewey wants. A democratic society is one in which all its members participate in the society's good on equal terms. And education in such a society will give young people a personal interest in social relationships and in social control, which is to say, management of the society. And it will train those people, a good education in a democratic society will train those young people in those habits of mind, in those ways of thinking and ways of, of living, which will bring about useful change in society. This is democracy and education. Now, before going to any subsequent chapters, let's make some quick observations on chapter 7 again. Chapter 7 is a nice passage for Dewey's response to Plato. Now, he's dealing with a fairly simple, very political interpretation of Plato's Republic. Uh, he's not much interested in or not much aware of the interpretation of the Republic that looks at the city Plato constructs, or the city Plato has Socrates construct in conversation, the, the Calipolis, the ideal society they describe, as a metaphor for the soul, an image, uh, a representation of justice in the soul, the, the perfect society described in the Republic, the just society described in the Republic is all an image for the just soul. And it's a separate interpretive question whether and to what extent and how precisely it's supposed to be uh, applied as a theory of politics. Dewey seems to take it straightforwardly as a theory of politics. So one mild disclaimer here, he's dealing with Plato's Republic on uh, one particular level and may not be dealing with uh, well, certainly he's not dealing with every level of the Republic, and may, depending on how precisely we're supposed to interpret the Republic, uh, be making some mistakes in his interpretation. But anyway, it's a fairly straightforward, surface-level reading of the Republic, and he says, Plato, no one could better express than did he the fact that a society is stably organized when each individual is doing that for which he has aptitude by nature in such a way as to be useful to others, or to contribute to the whole to which he belongs. And no one could have seen more clearly, or no one could have expressed better than Plato, that it is the business of education to discover these aptitudes, progressively to train them for social use. Plato in the Republic recognized that a society works best when each person in the society does that which he or she is best suited for, and that education should train us for these things. We should be trained for our proper role, which is determined by uh, whatever function in society we are best suited for. Now, Dewey's thinks, Dewey thinks Plato is just perfect on this point, and Plato is also perfect on this point. It would be impossible to find in any scheme of philosophic thought a more adequate recognition on one hand of the educational significance of social arrangements, and on the other of the dependence of those arrangements upon the means used to educate the young. It would be impossible to find a deeper sense of the function of education in discovering and developing personal capacities and training them so that they would connect with the activities of others. Dewey thinks Plato did a superb job recognizing that we have to connect our own personal interests with the interests of the society as a whole. And Education is supposed to train us to do this. But the society in which the theory was propounded was so undemocratic that Plato could not work out a solution for the problem whose terms he clearly saw. So Plato still failed. He understood rightly that our interests 
our individual interests are supposed to be connected to the interests of society as a whole. Our personal interests are supposed to be connected to the interests of others. Plato also understood that this works best when we do the job in society that we're best, best suited for. And Plato recognized that education f should train us for this, should train us to, to uh, contribute to society according to our own uh, natural, uh, what's the word Dewey says, aptitudes, our own natural aptitudes, our own, uh, our own nature, that for which he has aptitude by nature in such a way as to be useful to others. Plato understood that we should be trained by our education to contribute to society according to the role we are best suited for, based on how we are constructed. But Plato had a terribly undemocratic understanding of society, which means he made the mistake of thinking there are only three different kinds of people. The, um, uh, the ruling class, the military class, and um, the artisan class, or the, the, the workman class. Uh, the people who do all the manual labor, and the people who make things. There being no recognition that each individual constitutes his own class, there could be no recognition of the infinite diversity of active tendencies and combinations of tendencies of which an individual is capable. In fact, there shouldn't just be three different kinds of people recognized. The number of different kinds of people that should be recognized is the number of different people. Every human being is in, is in a class by himself or herself. What Plato failed to understand was that in order to best align our own interests with the interests of others, with the interests of society as a whole, and in order to best live according to what we are best suited for, and in order to have education train us to do this, Plato failed to realize that in order to do these things, what we really need to do is recognize the democratic principle that all people, although equal, are all different, and Every individual constitutes his own class. You can't just say these things about aligning our personal interests with the interests of society, about education training us for living according to uh, the function we are best suited for in society by uh, our own personal aptitude and nature based on however we are constructed. In order to do this, you have to recognize that there's more than three ways of constructing a human being. There are as many different ways as there are human beings. And education should train each individual to fulfill his or her own potential, not just the potential of one particular class uh, to which he or he may happen to belong. John Dewey hates dualism. We're in John Dewey's Democracy and Education. And dualism refers to a separation usually of mind from body or something like that. Sometimes it can refer to a separation of the active life from the contemplative life. Now, Dewey hates both kinds of dualism and other kinds as well. He also hates a separation of one class of human beings from another class of human beings. Dewey favors democracy, which in his understanding is much more than just a system of government. It's a way of life that uh, respects each individual and makes it possible for each individual to uh, reach his or her full potential and treats all people as equal and involves all people equally in society while engaging uh, their own uh, their own abilities to uh, to pitch in and make the world a better place. So Dewey Dewey doesn't like social dualism either. He doesn't like a separation of people who do one thing from people who do another thing. And he doesn't like the social dualism that he thinks correspond to these other dualisms. If you have a dualism of mind and body, or um, intellectual life from active life, you sometimes have a dualism of um, active people from thinking people. And Dewey thinks these things are connected. These things reinforce each other, and they're all bad, and they all need to go. So let's look at uh, the end of chapter 19 of Democracy and Education. Of the segregations of educational values discussed in the last chapter, that between culture and utility is probably the most fundamental. Dewey has been talking about different ways of segregating or separating different priorities in education, and the distinction between leisure and 
activity or between culture and utility, the distinction between the thinking person's life or the intellectual person's life uh, or the life of someone with cultural refinement and the life of someone else who just works. This distinction is bad. <laughs> this distinction is a bad way to live. This is a bad way to run a society. This is a bad way to do education. You shouldn't separate these things. Dewey doesn't want anything to be separated from anything else. There may be some distinctions to be made, but things are not supposed to be separated. Dewey is a holistic thinker. Now, the very end of chapter 19 here goes like this. The problem of education in a democratic society is to do away with the dualism and to construct a course of studies which makes thought a guide of free practice for all and, makes, and which makes leisure a reward of accepting responsibility for service rather than a state of exemption for it. In other words, everyone is supposed to think and everyone is supposed to work on equal terms. The dualism of mind and of the rest of life is a, a problem. This is what he's been critiquing in this book. Any perspective that separates the mind from the act of life and that would separate some people from other people according to according to whether their main purpose is to be the thinkers or to be the workers. This is uh, this dualism is what happens in flawed educational methods and Dewey is trying to promote a better educational method. This dualism is reflected in societies that have a working class and a leisurely class, those who have the leisure to think and those who do not. And Dewey wants to eliminate that separation, the social separation that parallels um, the separation of values, uh, thought versus action, and the separation of different uh, aspects of the human being, thought versus action. In fact, action and thought are really supposed to be the same thing. There should be no separation of thought and action, no separation of people who think and people who act, and no separation of mind from body either. In a democratic society, all should work, all should think, and the working and thinking should not be separated. That's what John Dewey says. John Dewey's Democracy and Education from Chapter 25 on the Theories of Knowledge. A number of theories of knowing have been criticized in the previous pages. In spite of their differences from one another, they all agree in one fundamental respect which contrasts with the theory which has been positively advanced. The latter assumes continuity. The former state or implies certain basic divisions, separations or antitheses, technically called dualisms. The origin of these divisions we have found in the hard and fast walls which mark off social groups and classes within a group, like those between rich and poor, men and women, noble and baseborn, ruler and ruled. Dewey has been criticizing different theories of knowledge and promoting his own theory of knowledge. And the theories of knowledge he's been criticizing are dualistic ones. They separate one thing from another thing where the separation should never take place. And they are contrasted with his own theory of knowledge, which is marked by continuity, where we refuse to separate these things. Now, Dewey's um, ethics and his epistemology parallel each other. The theory of society, the social and political philosophy, the theory about how human society should be uh, arranged, parallels his theory of knowledge. And he says these uh, flawed theories of knowledge he's dealing with parallel flawed social systems. They tend to, these tend to be social systems that separate people into different groups, like rich and poor, men and women, noble and baseborn, ruler and ruled. And these social systems of separation tend also to separate particular, uh, particular aspects of human experience in their own epistemologies, in their theory of knowing. Dewey wants a democratic conception of human society and paralleling it, he wants a conception of knowledge which is marked by continuity, where all of these things are not going to be separated. In a moment, we'll come to some illustrations of the things that are separated that should not be separated. But first, this sentence is well worth taking a look at. So far as these divisions persist and others are added to them, each leaves its mark upon the educational system. So long as society has these social divisions and a corresponding philosophical separation 
uh, different aspects of human experience in its theory of what knowledge is and how we get knowledge. So long as we have these dualistic epistemologies and these um, dualistic views of society, education is, to that extent, corrupted. And for that reason, corrupted. Education is messed up by these uh, separations that should not happen. These divisions, these social divisions, and also the, the epistemological divisions, leave their mark upon the educational system. Now, what are these divisions? Dewey will now review for a bit using, uh, the, using the terminology of philosophy, he says, what some of these divisions are. In the first place, there is the opposition of empirical and higher rational knowing. You're not supposed to separate reason from experience. We'll let him elaborate when we turn off the video and read the book, which is always recommended. Another dualism is that of activity and passivity and knowing. Skipping over his elaboration, the dualism of activity and passivity knowing. You're not supposed to separate active knowing from receiving knowledge from the world. Uh, purely empirical and physical things are often supposed to be known by receiving impressions. This is, I believe, drawing from the um, uh, the earlier tradition of British empiricism, which tended to understand knowledge in terms of, or at least having its foundation, in, well, passive reception of influences from the world. You could look at the early pages of Thomas Hobbes' Leviathan, for example, where knowledge begins with the human mind being affected by the world outside it. And it's a very passive thing. And Dewey says, although he's, although he is uh, in the broader tradition of empiricism, that means he thinks knowledge comes from experience and he'll draw from people like the British empiricist. But he's going to say that the, the way they were constructing their empirical theories wasn't quite, wasn't quite right. Dewey says, knowledge is not supposed to be purely passive, and certainly not to be purely active either. You're not supposed to separate activity and passivity and knowing. Rather, you're supposed to have a process that includes both aspects. Skipping a bit. Another current opposition is that said to exist between the intellect and the emotions. These days, we may wish to, I certainly wish to, reference uh, Spock and McCoy. You are not supposed to separate these different aspects of the human being, uh, the emotional and the rational. Not that uh, McCoy is is um, irrational emotions as such, but in the, the Spock versus McCoy dynamic in the original Star Trek, you do seem to have some 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 exploration of these, these different aspects of humanity. Um, Spock represents pure logic. McCoy represents something else. And really, you're not supposed to, to separate them. You're supposed to have an integrated humanity, which perhaps was the message of the original Star Trek, but at any rate, it's certainly the message of John Dewey. Now, he's going to, in this chapter, spend a little bit of time explaining what things help to show us now that these dualisms are not appropriate. I'm not going to read them all. Let me give the introductory sentence. We shall be content to summarize the forces which tend to make the untenability of this conception obvious and to replace it by the idea of continuity. He's trying to overcome dualistic theories of education, dualistic theories of knowledge that separate different aspects of the process by which humans gain knowledge. Or, in fact, let's, let's rephrase that. He's trying to give us... He's trying to overcome dualisms of different aspects of humanity. He's trying to overcome theories of how society works and models for organizing society that separate us from one another, separate us off into different groups. He's trying to overcome social division. He's trying to overcome epistemological dualisms that separate one aspect of human knowing from another aspect. And we should think of human knowing as itself a process, not a final product. Knowledge is a process, and it's a process that includes all of these different things in an integrated fashion that these different theories are separating. And he's, of course, trying to overcome the bad effects in educational systems of these dualisms. Just to name one very simple example, if, um, if we think that sitting and reading books, passively absorbing information without ever actually 
doing anything is the same thing as knowledge until <laughs> he says we're wrong. Knowledge does not come from receiving information from books passively. Now, definitely include the books, but knowledge does involve action. Knowledge must involve action. Knowledge involves experience in the world, not just the the accumulated bits of experience that have been written down in books. Now, those do have a place in knowledge. I don't think Dewey is saying there should be no books in school. He's saying books in school do not give us knowledge as we sit and passively receive it from the books. We are supposed to be applying what we get in books and seeing if it works. Apply it in experience. The scientific method is, well, a component of his educational theory, but you could also understand it as, uh, in part at least, a model for how it should all go. Receive the information, test it in experience, see if it works. Now, now back to the, that sentence before I got sidetracked. We shall be content to summarize the forces which tend to make the untenability of this conception obvious and to replace it by the idea of continuity. He's trying to overcome these dualisms and replace them with a theory of knowledge as continuity, paralleling his theory of human society as a continuity. Now I'm going to skip over the first two things which tend to make these dualisms untenable theories and to replace a dualistic model with a continuous model. Let's go to the third though. The development of the experimental method as the method of getting knowledge and making, it sh of making sure it is knowledge and not mere opinion, the method of both discovery and proof is the remaining great force in bringing out a transformation in the theory of knowledge, what we now will refer to as the scientific method, the experimental method, as the method of getting knowledge. The development of the scientific method helps to show how we cannot anymore pretend to have all these separations. We can't have separations in human society between one group and another group, and we can't have a separation in our theory of knowledge between um, empirical and higher rational knowing or between activity and passive reception of facts and we can't have a separation between intellect and emotions and we can't have a separation in education between for example um, say some sort of very practical scientific education and some um, uh, very passive sit and read books kind of education everything must be integrated in a holistic fashion, uh, in a continuous fashion, continuity rather than dualism. The experimental method as the method of getting knowledge and of making sure it is knowledge by testing. This method is the remaining great force in bringing out a transformation in the theory of knowledge. This is the method of both discovery and proof of receiving information from experience. You could consider that the passive aspect, but then of testing it of bringing about proof by applying your theory where you interpret that information from experience to, to reach some conclusion. And you take that theory and you test it, you apply it in experience. That's the active aspect. Both are aspects of the process of knowledge and the scientific method helps us see how we're supposed to be integrating these things. Now, this next part may be a little bit more difficult for me to explain, but I think I'm going to give it a shot skipping a bit as I've been doing throughout. There are various systems of philosophy with characteristically different conceptions of the method of knowing. He goes over some of these theories and then he states uh, briefly his own theory of knowledge. In brief, the function of knowledge is to make one experience freely available in other experiences. Dewey is about uh, holisticity or holism, about integration, about replacing dualisms with continuity. The function of knowledge is to make one experience freely available in other experiences. See how this, this sentence connects to the scientific method. The goal is to make one experience freely available in other experiences. You have an experience. You encounter the world and it gives you some information about the world and you use that information in the future. You take that experience from the past and you apply it in the future and see if your theories of the world informed by that experience hold up in the future. Learn from experience, take your theories back to experience for further testing and analysis. Use what you learn to, to guide future experience in the world. Make one 
experience freely available in other experiences. Honestly, I'm not sure if I can just take a um, a systematic approach to explaining all that. I don't know that I can boil it down to a set of bullet points. I can just state and restate in different words and hope it all comes together for you. And honestly, that's how I read Dewey anyway. I, I don't know how to find one passage in Dewey that um, explains everything in bullet points. Um, you just keep reading and eventually sometimes it starts all coming together. Anyway, knowledge. Skipping a bit. Knowledge is a perception of those connections of an object which determine its applicability in a given situation. Another nice definition of knowledge from Dewey. Knowledge is a perception of those connections of an object which determine its applicability in a given situation. You're supposed to understand how a thing can be applied in different situations. So, the function of knowledge is to make one experience freely available in other experiences. Knowledge is a perception of those connections of an object which determine its applicability in a given situation. Take what you have learned about a thing from some experience and figure out how to apply what you have learned in a different situation in a future experience, making one experience relevant to another and learning how that particular thing you've learned about in the first experience, how it applies, how that thing is connected in other situations, how that thing is connected to the world, how your knowledge of that object can be applied in other experiences in different situations. Skipping page or two, for one has only to call to mind what is sometimes treated in schools as acquisition of knowledge to realize how lacking it is in any fruitful connection with the ongoing experience of the students. How largely it seems to be believed that the mere appropriation of subject matter which happens to be stored in books constitutes knowledge. You can't get knowledge by sitting and reading books. No matter how true what is learned to those who found it out and in whose experience it functioned, there is nothing which makes it knowledge to the pupils. It might as well be something about Mars or about some fanciful country unless it fructifies in the individual's own life fructifies is probably not a word you use every day. Fructifies. Let's um, parallel it with um, uh, some synonymous phrase. Makes it fruitful. No matter how true what is learned to those who found it out and who, in whose experience it functioned, there is nothing which makes it knowledge to the pupils. It might as well be something about Mars or about some fanciful country unless it makes itself fruitful in the individual's own life. The student is not merely to get information from books, but is to be able to apply that information in her or his own life. That's what makes it useful. And without that application, without that taking of the old information from the old experiences that were the source of the knowledge we get in books, without taking that information and applying it to new experiences in our own lives, without that process of making one experience relevant to another, without that process of receiving information, reprocessing, reapplying in future experience, without that process of uh, taking an object known from a past situation and figuring out how it applies in a future situation without that process there simply is no knowledge and all the the dualistic theories of knowledge and all the botched philosophies of education consist of taking one aspect of that process and then isolating it from all the others you're supposed to have all of them together that's how knowledge works that's how life works that's how education should work and, of course, that's how society should work. You're not supposed to separate the different parts of society from one another. The theory, nearly at the end of the chapter now, the theory of the method of knowing which is advanced in these pages may be termed pragmatic. Its essential feature is to maintain the continuity of knowing with an activity which purposely modifies the environment. Now, this, this reapplication in future experience of what we've picked up from past experience, the, the active aspect of this process, that, to be sure, has its passive aspect as well. All of this, uh, all these ways we can describe it, the, the active aspect, the application, the reinterpretation and future experience, blah, 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 this all may be, this whole process may be termed pragmatic, and the, the reapplication aspect, the active aspect, is to maintain the continuity, oh, sorry, is to uh, purposely modify the environment. You're supposed to take the old information and modify the environment in future, which of course is 
um, modeled on the scientific method. You're supposed to take the information from the theory you got from past experience and reapply it in some future experience in which you change something to gain future data and make sure your theory was right. You change something. You modify the environment in your application of the scientific method. You're supposed to take the knowledge you got from the past. Well, knowledge is the process of taking the information you got from the past and reapplying it with uh, intentional modification of the environment in the future to, well, in part to make sure the theory is still good. Uh, the, the scientific method. Um, uh, hypothesize, test, revise if you must, but also to to make the world a better place. There's no separation of knowledge from ethics. This is this is John Dewey. Everything's supposed to be integrated. It's not like you can say the point is to gain a theory that's got better evidence in its favor from from empirical investigation and and leave out the whole moral component of, of making the world a better place. That's very much the point, to make the world a better place. But you can't say that is the point and ignore the theory. These are one and the same. It's all part of the same process. From past experience, you get some theory. That theory is to be applied in future experience, which is to render our future theories more, uh, more accurate, more reliable, better evidence, but also the point of intentionally applying these theories in the world as part of future testing, but in a way that makes the world a better place. There's the, the if you want to call it this way, the intellectual aspect, and then there's the moral aspect. And the whole process of doing all of these things is the process of knowledge. And in it's Dewey, we'll try to say everything is everything. <laughs> I'm oversimplifying a bit, but he'll, he'll say everything is something. He'll say everything is education. This process is the process of knowledge. This process is what knowledge is, and this process is education. So, I think we can just about be finished with this chapter. Knowledge is to be thought of, now I'm, I'm uh, reading or paraphrasing my own notes that I jotted down. Knowledge is to be thought of as continuous, not dualistic. And a society's social structure is connected to its view of knowledge. Knowledge is what makes one experience available in other experiences by perceiving the connections of an object which determine how it can be applied in future situations. And there's no knowledge without experience, but there's also no true experience without intentionally modifying, with an intent to improve the environment. Again, it's all of these things. All the things together is what Dewey is getting at. There's not just the past experience that gave us the, the theories and the propositions that might have been written down in some textbook, there is that past experience, this set of information and theories that might be written in a textbook, and then there is applying them in the future in order to get a better theory, a better set of theories, but also in order to experience the world better in the future, make the world a better place. You're supposed to take these past experiences and the knowledge we get from them, well, the information we get from them, and reapply it in future with intentional ways of changing the world based on those theories to make the world a better place, but also to receive data for more future better theories. This process is what knowledge is, this process is what education is, and this is where we get uh, good theories, call it the, um, uh, the intellectual aspect, but then there's a moral aspect of the whole thing when you take this knowledge and reapply it in future experience, you're supposed to be doing so with uh, an intentional modification of the world to make the world a better place. Dewey's Democracy and Education, the final chapter of the book, Theories of Morals, Chapter 26. Since morality is concerned with conduct, any dualisms which are set up between mind and activity must reflect themselves in the theory morals. So, Dewey has spent the whole book critiquing and trying to overcome dualistic accounts of lots of things. Dualistic accounts of the human being, for example, separating mind from action, or dualistic accounts and dualistic accounts of how knowledge works, for example, separating reason from experience, or, uh, or again, separating 
bind from action because that's also a dualism uh, in epistemology, a separation of one thing from another thing that are supposed to be in the structure of the human being, but also in the structure of knowledge. They're supposed to be integrated. They're supposed to be united, not two separate things, maybe not even two distinct things, but perhaps two uh, separate sides of the same coin, two distinct but not separate sides of the same coin. Two sides of a coin are not separate. Different aspects of the same integrated whole that is humanity or that is human experience or that is knowledge. He's trying to reintegrate, rediscover the integration of all these things. And he's also opposing any social dualism that would go along with this. The book is Democracy and Education. He doesn't want society to be split up into different parts. For example, the thinking people and the acting people. No, no. All of us are supposed to be thinking. All of us are supposed to be acting. And thinking and acting are supposed to be part of the same process of human experience in the world. And this, um, uh, these dualistic theories will have their moral applications. And that moral application is going to corrupt education. Any dualisms which are set up between mind and activity must reflect themselves in the theory of morals. Since the formulations of the separation and the philosophic theory of morals are used to justify and idealize the practices employed in moral training, a brief critical discussion is in place. In other words, he's going to critique these dualisms one more time because they're going to corrupt moral training, which is to say they're going to corrupt education. A good education is going to be holistic. It's going to unite those things that uh, other more flawed views separated. It's going to unite the dualism set up in epistemology, reason and experience or, or something like that, and the dualisms set up in humanity, like thought and action, and the dualism set up in society between different groups or different classes of people. It's democracy and education he's talking about. A democratic conception of education is going to parallel a holistic conception of the human person. A, an integrated account of the human person is going to have its expression in a democratic society where we don't separate people corresponding to the way we would separate uh, the different aspects of human knowledge or the different aspects of the human being if we were these dualists. And a good education is going to have to apply all these things. And it's going to be uh, a good moral education, not just an education for knowledge that teaches us how to uh, think and live and to unite thinking and living. It's also going to be a moral education because all of these things are connected. Democracy and Education is a book that's about overcoming all these dualisms and all these separations and uniting all of these things, integrating all of these things. I'm not going to go over his uh, final critique of all the dualisms, but let's look at some of the remarks he sets up at the end of the book, last uh, three pages, on what a democratic conception in education is going to actually look like. The measure of the worth of the administration, curriculum, and methods of instruction of the school is the extent to which they are animated by a social spirit. A good education is going to be animated by a social spirit, which is to say, I think something like this. It's going to be something that trains the student to recognize the good of the community in his own good. To, or maybe we should say vice versa, to recognize that his own goodness is uh, linked to the goodness of the community, not his own goodness, his own good. What is good for him is linked to what is good for the community. A social spirit should animate the curriculum methods of instruction and the administration of a school. Now, how, how do you make this practical? How do you animate the curriculum, the administration, and the methods of instruction of a school with a social spirit? Well, two conditions must be met for this to happen. In the first place, the school must itself be a community life in all which that implies. Playgrounds, shops, workrooms, laboratories not only direct the natural active tendencies of youth, but they involve intercourse, or you could say interaction in more modern English, interaction, communication, and cooperation, all extending the perception of connections. The 
education is going to be social in that it's going to integrate individual with group by means of playground shops, workrooms, laboratories, etc. Not only directing the active natural tendencies of the young scholar, but also involving that scholar in interaction, communication, and cooperation with others in all these activities. Second condition for a social spirit of education, social spirit in education. The learning in school should be continuous with that out of school. There must be no separation of education in the classroom from life outside of the classroom. Maybe a distinction, but no separation. Again, two sides of the same coin. Maybe you can distinguish them. Two different aspects of the same whole connected experience, but not separate. Maybe you can distinguish them, but you can't separate them. There should be free interplay between the two. This is possible only when there are numerous points of contact between the social interests of the one and of the other. The social interests within the school and with life outside of school should be connected. Skipping to the next paragraph. There is an old saying to the effect that it is not enough for a man to be good, he must be good for something. Dewey, I think, agrees with this old saying. It's not enough for a person to be good, you have to be good for something. The something for which a man must be good is capacity to live as a social member, so that what he gets from living with others balances with what he contributes. The something for which a person is good, it's not enough that you are good, you must be good for something. And what is that something? It is communal life. It is a life in community with other human beings where you live as a social member in such a way that what you get from living with others balances with what you contribute. You are giving uh, no less than you take. Education is such a life. To maintain capacity for such education is the essence of morals. For conscious life is a continual beginning afresh. I think I won't comment on that. Education is such a life. To maintain capacity for such education is the essence of morals. For conscious life is a continual beginning afresh. But I welcome you to uh, read the book and or go back to earlier videos or much earlier segment of this video if you're watching this in the great text playlist and uh, review what he says at the beginning of the book about uh, the renewal of life and education and maybe you'll be able to make sense of that remark. Conscious life is a continual beginning afresh. Now very briefly, the third last sentence of the book, all education which develops power to share effectively in social life is moral. A moral education is one which trains the student in a shared communal life with others. Now finally let me read or paraphrase from some of my own notes that I jotted down at the end of the book on this chapter. There is no dualism in morality between inner motive and outer conduct or between duty and interest nor is it the case that reason is separated from practical daily moral active life. All these moralistic dualisms spring from failing to treat morality as social in nature. That's something you'll probably find in more detail if you go to the first few pages of the chapter and study his critique of these dualistic theories of education. In fact, education must be social. The school must be a community life, and learning in school should be continuous with learning out of school so that so that all these things may be integrated so that mind and action may be integrated, so that reason and experience may be integrated, so that individual and community may be integrated, so that my interest and the interests of others may be integrated, so that inner motive and outer conduct may be integrated, so that duty and interest, personal interest and duty to others may be integrated so that reason and act reason and action reason and activity may be integrated so that the thinking life and the active life may be integrated all these things are supposed to be integrated and never assume that one is subsumed into the other don't hear me please don't hear me saying uh so that the individual and the group may be integrated and think i'm saying uh some form of commun communitarian socialism or something where uh, the individual is subsumed within the group. No, no, that's not it. Uh, the individual and the community are symbiotic. Uh, this is not my language. This is uh, borrowed from Dewey scholar Stuart Rosenbaum of Baylor University. Individual and community are completely symbiotic in Dewey, as, as Rosenbaum uh, correctly puts it. 
a separation in theory of knowledge and a separation in theory of the human being and a separation of different priorities in education that correspond to all these other separations and again a separation of human society into different groups all of these things are connected and they're all bad we should fix all of them get a working understanding of the fact that all of these are to be united and are indeed united in human experience properly understood and apply this in education that's how a democratic education ought to work thanks for watching uh dewey is a beautiful writer if you didn't understand me don't don't blame dewey i guess blame me but um you know it's worth spending some time reading dewey for yourself and trying to figure it out this book is big if uh if the book itself seems challenging uh Find a shorter reading or read uh, significant portions of this. Like, uh, just read the chapters I've commented on here, if you like. Or read the whole book, whatever you can manage, whatever you like. But Dewey is well worth reading, and I, I encourage some of you to go and do it. Go and read. Go and read good books. Don't, don't let me do all your reading for you. Not all of it. Maybe some. Bye.